All right. Welcome to Unit 5, Jacksonian Democracy and Westward Expansion. And today we're going to talk about Jacksonian democracy. And that's really a transition from Thomas Jefferson and his supporters and what they believed in to what Andrew Jackson and his supporters believed in. And also a change in democratic, um, oh, what's the word? Involvement. There we go. So we have, uh, obviously, Andrew Jackson is going to be inaugurated, looks like in 1829. And this is a painting of him being inaugurated. And over here, we have a political cartoon. And I want you to just take a look at it really quick and see if you think if it's negative or if it's positive. And we'll come back to it. Okay. All right, so let's get an idea of what politics was like back in around 1821, before Andrew Jackson was president. <clears throat> um, politics were largely dominated by deference. And what that means is that the people were really um, submitted to and respected whoever was in charge, specifically the, the local elites or the privileged people the upper class or whoever the leading family was at the time in in the city or the town or the the village or whatever um, and usually elections weren't actually democratic and what I mean by that was that like most states had some kind of property and tax paying requirements on the white adult males who alone had the vote and they voted by voice. Think about that for a second. Would you vote the way you wanted to if you had to say it out loud? I don't know. Presidential electors were generally chosen by state legislatures, not by the people themselves. And because of that, it is not surprising that voting participation was generally really low. Less than 30% of adult white males actually voted. But between 1820 and 1840, that actually changed. The states started to see that it was kind of elitist or privileged for some of these people, and they started taking away those qualifications, specifically property qualifications, so that whoever uh, whoever was white and male could actually vote when they did not have to have property because most people didn't. They also created more polling places and easier places to get to. That'd be like beforehand, if I lived in West Fork, my polling place might be in Fayetteville. And in 1821, I'd either have to hop a horse or walk. And that would have taken a really long time. So what they're saying is they opened more polling places like actually one in West Fork where I could actually get to it a lot easier. Also, they opened the, the polls were open a lot longer. Today, I think they go from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., making sure everybody has access to a time where they can vote. And they also pretty much canceled out voting by voice and went to secret ballot. So that not only allowed, you know, the white male adult white males uh, to vote, but the, but more of them actually did. And voter participation actually skyrocketed. By 1840, it looked like 80% of adult white males went to the polls, and that's astronomical. That doesn't even happen today. And of course, unfortunately, there were no vote voting rights for women or free blacks at the time. But this is progress. Generally, history takes baby steps rather than leaps and bounds. And so eventually, obviously, women will get the right to vote and blacks will get the right to vote as well. So because more, like, quote unquote, common people had the opportunity to vote, they kind of went after what they considered the privileged class. And those people would be considered those who worked in the church, because they had a lot of political power and influence, the bench, which means judges in the court system, 
and then the legal and medical professions, so lawyers and doctors, also were considered elite. But because more people were actually voting, they also decided that they could participate as and become politicians. And there was a really cool thing that happened because of that. It was a change in vocabulary. So instead of these elite words like standing for office, they used everyday language like running for office, which is still what we use today. So during the first quarter of the 19th century, there was actually a lot of local elites that lost a lot of their influence and they were replaced by professional politicians. Like a little kid could grow up to one day and say, hey, I want to be a politician. And that would be their job. Um, one of these political innovators was Martin Van Buren. Hopefully you've heard of this guy because he eventually becomes president of the United States. So he devised new campaign tools like torchlight parades. So parades by torchlight using newspapers to get the word out. And then probably the most effective way to campaign was to attack the privilege, saying they had no clue what the common people wanted and they were doing everything for their own benefit and trying to um, make money for themselves and really it wasn't for them, uh, for the people. And that worked very well. <laughs> So this actually helped create new political parties. So after the War of 1812, there was only one political party, and that was the Anti-Federalists. Okay, remember we had the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and the Federalists um, kind of disappeared after the War of 1812. So there was only one political party, and so that only gives you a couple of choices in terms of candidates, or and but all the issues are going to be agreed upon at, up to a point. So if there's no competition from the outside because of political parties, then there's something going to happen within the one that's there. So there were three things that created this second party system. Three major issues that people were undecided on how to fix, so to speak. And those were the financial panic of 1819. So there were some money issues that were going on. And within the Anti-Federalists, they, they couldn't come to an agreement on how to fix it. So that caused some tension. The other thing that was a big deal was slavery. So the South was starting to become really concerned about their way of life and there were slavery debates in Congress, specifically during the Missouri crisis, like we've already talked about in 1819 and 1820. Fortunately, I guess at the time, the compromise of 1820 proposed by Henry Clay kind of smoothed that over, but there still was that tension in, in, in Congress about that. And then one of the other main issues that helped split this one political party was what was what Andrew Jackson and his supporters called the corrupt bargain. And um, we'll talk about that. Let me show you what that looks like on the next slide. So this is basically who became president in 1824. And it was between Andrew Jackson, JQA, which is John Quincy Adams, and Henry Clay. So let's talk look let's take a look at that. So this is a, a map of the presidential election in 1824. This is after mm, James Monroe, I believe. So we have four candidates here. We got J, John, John Quincy Adams, the son of second president John Adams. You have Andrew Jackson some guy named Crawford, sorry, and then Henry Clay. And based on the map, it looks like green has won. 
which in fact, he does have the majority of the votes in the electoral college, as well as the popular vote. Okay, but according to the Constitution, you have to have a certain amount of electoral votes, which Andrew Jackson did not have. Okay, so what happened was Henry Clay decided to persuade his own supporters to vote for John Quincy Adams, and that put him over the top to become the next president. And Andrew Jackson and his supporters were ticked off. And he called this a corrupt bargain between Clay and Adams so they could win the presidency and Jackson would not. So that will come into play a little bit later on. So we still have um, John Quincy Adams as what he calls the National Republican Party. That kind of morphed from an anti-federalist to what is now known as the Republicans or Democratic Republicans, or National Republicans. They're all the same. So this was one of John Quincy Adams' um, flyer, I guess you could say, to vote for him. When, and I like it because it's kind of funny. Um, so he's going back to his father, like John Adams, but Quincier. And what he's trying to say, I'm not sure. Maybe he's just he thinks he's better that he'll be better than his dad. But um, I like his the play on his middle name, Quincier. It's kind of silly. So what was John Quincy Adams like? He was actually an extremely well qualified and brilliant man. He was deeply religious. He was extremely well educated. He read biblical passages at least three times a day, once in English, once in German, and once in French. He was fluent in seven foreign languages, including Greek and Latin. And he was a diplomat before he was president. He was secretary of state. He nego negotiated the treaty that ended the War of 1812. He helped acquire Florida and came up with the Monroe Doctrine. Unfortunately, he lacked the political skills and personality to create support for his ideas as president. So he was like his father. He, he lacked a lot of personal warmth, and his opponents uh, described him as a chip off the old iceberg. So kind of negative there. Um, so, and some of his policies were unpopular as well. Um, so he favored a high tariff. And at the time, there was no income tax, meaning based on what you made, you had to pay a tax. That's not how they made money. The government made money back then. It was tariffs, like taxes on exports and imports. And he used that money to help finance the new roads and the canals like the Erie Canal, universities and observatories. So he was helping, he was using that money to further the progress of the United States. And he also favored a strong central government. But Indian, his Indian policies cost him supporters. Um, a lot of people thought that we should just take Indian land and move them off. He felt like he should uphold the treaties that were created before him and purchase the land instead of take it from the Native Americans. And a lot of people didn't like that. He also felt like the federal government should support the economy through a tariff. And the Southerners were angry about that because they were largely agricultural and didn't export a whole lot of stuff except for you know, cotton, like big cash crops kind of thing. Um, and so the Southerners felt like he supported just the Northeastern states. And so he, he was not a popular president. I think he was a good one. I, just, I think he m may have been good at the wrong time, maybe. So anyway, let's see what else we got here. 
Okay, so because of this corrupt bargain that we talked about earlier, there were a lot of Andrew Jackson supporters who reacted to um, Adams and tried to make him look bad, basically. So, let's see. So he was committed, Adams was committed to using the federal government to promote development of the nation. And again, he used that one of those high tariffs to promote industry. Um, and, and Henry Clay, his Secretary of State, whom we know, really supported this as well. But again, the Southerners didn't like it. And so Andrew Jackson supporters looked to to embarrass Adams and help Jackson win the presidency in the next term in 1828. So they created a bill which became known as the Tariff of Abominations and to win support for Jackson in Kentucky, Missouri, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania while trying to weaken Adams in the New England states. So the bill raised taxes on iron, hemp, and flax and lowered taxes on woolen goods. and. This was supposed to hurt New England and help the Westerners. And the South went bananas over it. They said it was unconstitutional and it discriminated against them. And it was only to help Northern manufacturers. And the one who was the loudest was South Carolina. So this becomes a problem. And the vice president, ironically, is, Pre is John C. Calhoun. And he said, you know what? Um, he wrote an essay talking about nullification, which we'll get into in a second. He said, a single state might overrule or nullify a law, like a federal law, within its own territory until three quarters of the states had upheld the law as constitutional. And South Carolina took that under consideration and uses that later on. So tariff of abominations that was created by Al um, Andrew Jackson supporters actually kind of backfired and ticked off the South in a major way, which has consequences. So during this time, it's been four years, and it's time to elect another president, either re-elect John Quincy Adams or elect Andrew Jackson. And it was a really bitter campaign. It was extremely negative. And you thought Trump versus Clinton was negative. This one was as well. It, was, it went something like this. J.Q. Adams, who can write and that's referring to his education, squared off against Andy Jackson, who can fight. And that refers back to General Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans before or after the War of 1812. Jackson's followers repeated the charge that Adams was an aristocrat, or crat, meaning he was elite. He didn't know what the common people needed, and he obtained his office through that corrupt bargain. The Jackson forces also alleged that the president had used public funds to buy personal things and had installed gaming tables like poker tables in the White House, which, you know, back then was a big no-no. They even charged that Mrs. Adams had been born out of wedlock. So now they're attacking his family on a personal level. But Adams did did the same thing. So Adams supporters countered by digging up an old story that Jackson had begun living with his wife before she was legally divorced from her first husband. They also called the general a slave trader, a gambler, and a backwards buffoon who could not spell more than one word out of four correctly. And one Philadelphia editor published a handbill or a flyer picturing the coffins of 12 men allegedly murdered by Jackson in numerous duels. So they are digging deep for some negative stuff on both candidates on both sides. 
But Andrew Jackson was smart. He used skilled political organizers like Martin Van Buren to create support from the common people through mass rallies, parades, barbecues. Hey, let's feed these guys and then they'll vote for us. And hickory polls. Now, if you've ever messed with hickory, you know that it's a very tough and strong piece of wood. And Andrew Jackson's nickname was old hickory so they would have these parades and hold up these poles made out of hickory called hickory poles and because of these rallies so to speak the election participation increased dramatically so you can guess who won this one so you know that Philadelphia editor I was talking to you about? Here is one of the handbills that they put out. And they're actually listing some of the names of the people he supposedly murdered through these duels. But here's also a, a drawing. It's called a Hickory Pole election. I don't know if you can see that down there. And again, Hickory Poles were a symbol of Andrew Jackson, whose nickname was Old Hickory, meaning he's really tough. So this is a similar map from the 1824, but you can see hands down who won. And it was Andrew Jackson. All the yellow. So let me tell you a little, just a little bit about Andrew Jackson. He he was truly a self-made man. He was born in 1767 in the frontier region along the North and South Carolina border. He was the first president to be born in a log cabin. His father was a poor form farmer from Northern Ireland and died two weeks before his birth, while his mother and two brothers died during the American Revolution. At the age of 13, Jackson volunteered to fight in the American Revolution. And he was taken prisoner, and a British officer severely slashed Jackson's hand and head when the boy refused to shine the officer's shoes. So even at a young age, you can see how maybe defiant he was, rebellious he was. But Jackson soon rose from poverty to a career in law and politics. Uh, he became Tennessee's first congressman, a senator, and judge on the state Supreme Court, and Although he would later gain a reputation as a champion of the common people in Tennessee, he was allied by marriage, business, and political ties to the state's elite. So even though he, I think he grew up as being a common person, he eventually reached that elite status, but um, still kind of came off as a rough and tumble common kind of guy. He was a land speculator, a cotton planter, an attorney. He accumulated a large personal fortune and acquired more than 100 slaves. His candidacy for the presidency was initially promoted by speculators and creditors and the elite leaders in Tennessee, hoping to benefit from it. So his, his presidency is known for a couple of things. Um, let me move, move the next, to the next slide. So a lot of the things that he is known for during his presidency is his presidential use of presidential power. Um, and the issues that he faced during that. Now we talked just a smidge about nullification and we'll get it more into that in just a minute. He's also known, you know, prior to his presidency, the Indian as an Indian fighter, and he has some strong uh, convictions on the need to remove Native Americans from their land. There's also something called the Second Bank War, which we'll talk about in a minute. And during his presidency, there were a lot of people who were not happy with him. And so another political party came out to oppose him. And those are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about nullification first. So nullification. What? What the what? The nullification is the refusal of a United a U.S. state to follow a federal law. 
when you take government, I think in 11th grade or 12th grade, you will understand that obviously the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and that covers everybody. And that comes from the national government. All laws have to follow the Constitution. The national laws that are passed by Congress has to follow the Constitution. Those laws are over state laws. State laws have to follow the Constitution. And the states have to be under the authority of the federal government. So, if a state doesn't like a federal law, should they be able to refuse to follow it? That's the issue that comes up during Andrew Jackson's presidency. Now, as I said before, John Calhoun was in favor of nullification. And there were some problems that were coming up because of this. Um, the North versus the South basically started to happen again. And um, Daniel Webster, who was part of uh, Congress, he's from Massachusetts, said, okay, listen, we are the United States of America. It is a creation of the people, not a compact or an agreement of the states. Remember we tried that already with the Articles of Confederation? That didn't work. It's either, either all or nothing. The states cannot say, nope, not going to do it. If, if the people agree to elect people to represent them, then the states have to follow the federal law that is passed by those represent rep representatives. If you have a disagreement, that's great. That's part of democracy. But you have to go through the correct procedures to do that. And that is to sue the federal court, court through the Supreme Court. Now, nowhere is it okay to nullify federal law because that would lead to anarchy and civil war. <laughs> okay, so hint, hint, this is a foreshadowing of things to come here. Even out, um, Andrew Jackson said, our union, it must be preserved, and we can't have rogue states going out and disobeying, you know, and snubbing federal law. It's just not going to happen. It shouldn't happen. Well, the issue at hand that brings us to light is the tariff of 1832. So he was trying to, Andrew Jackson was trying to appease those Southerners who were really angry, especially South Carolina, about um, how they said it was unconstitutional and discriminatory. And so he said, okay, fine, I, I see where you're going. I see why you're looking at this. And so we're gonna lower the tax to help you out. Well, it didn't help. And, and the ironic thing is that the United States was debt free by 1835. The United States Treasury at the time had a balance of $440,000 in surplus, meaning it had extra money. And it wasn't owed to anyone. And this was the only time in the US history when the government was completely free of debt. And so that, it's kind of hard to justify lowering or, you know, taking away these tariffs if they actually helped the government. But it, South Carolina was like, I don't care what you do, we're not doing it, and declared the tariff of 1832 null and void and would not pay the tax. And so to defend their right of nullification, the state legislature voted to raise an army. 
Now, why would they do that? So they could fight off the tax collectors, basically, so they would not have to follow the law. And Jackson was like, um, yeah, nullification is illegal. And Congress, will you empower me to use force to execute the federal law? So they passed something called the Force Act, which allowed Jackson to raise an army and Navy to force them to pay their taxes. So <laughs> they were like about to go to war over taxes. So something needed to be done because obviously Jackson, this military guy, wasn't going to back down. Okay. And, and by the way, South Carolina was the only state at the time to <laughs> expose themselves, I guess, or stand up. They were the only one that was doing this. So um, Henry Clay, as we know, who created the Missouri Compromise of 1820, also known as the Great Compromiser, worked really hard to reduce South Carolina's sense of grievance, if you will, or honor. Um, he said, he who loves the union must desire to see this agitating question brought to a termination. Basically, hey, we got to, we got to fix this. In less than a month, he persuaded Congress to enact a compromise tariff with lower levels of protection for South Carolina and South Carolinians did back down um, and they took back their null and void on the federal tariff. So this is called the compromise tariff. So it even lowered taxes more um, to appease South Carolina. Interestingly enough, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the union when the Civil War started, just so you know. South Carolina is in a lot of stuff. All right, so nullification was a big deal. The other issue that Jackson had to deal with was something called the Bank War. And what this is all about is that Alexander, Alexander Hamilton created the first United States Bank. And what its job was to was was to watch state banks to make sure that there was enough money in there and they were doing what they were supposed to and it was just watching what others were doing and making sure the money flowed correctly and um, intervened when it was necessary and Andrew Jackson uh, disapproved of this bank and and usually what Congress did was create the bank for a certain amount of time and afterwards they would do something called recharter it or like extend its time and and during Andrew Jackson's presidency that time was up but he felt like this bank which was kind of the overseer of the other banks cheated the small farmers and it wasn't fair to the little people so he was fighting for the common man which you know a lot of people really um, admired about him. So when it, the Congress said, okay, we want to recharter the second bank of the United States, he vetoed it. And that outraged a lot of people, especially business owners and manufacturers and indus industry people. Um, but a lot of the businesses were like, what? That's not fair. And initially it did help create an economic boom because that allowed for more freedom of people to go in and take out loans to improve their farm or their business. But in the long run, I think it actually led to a national depression, which if you take out a loan, you can't pay for it, then the bank loses money, that kind of thing. And historians debate the effects of his decision over the bank. And um, that's pretty much all I know about the bank war, but he, he was fighting for the little people and while he was trying to help, maybe it did for a little while, but later it didn't. And sometimes we can't 
foresee the future of the consequences of those kinds of things. And, you know, someone's got to at least try. And I think he did. And, uh, yeah, how to deal with the consequences. All right. So I think part of the this nullification thing and the bank war, for some pe people, they felt like Andrew Jackson was becoming this out of touch king person. And that, you know, his military background gave him this sense of he was born to command and you see he he's looking like a king and he has the veto in his hand here and what is he stepping on here hmm the constitution so he's using his own power to step on the foundations of the united states basically and you can see here king andrew the first So this is not a positive image of Andrew Jackson. Um, and these are, this is, this would be considered a political cartoon. One of many that we will look at throughout the rest of the year. So because there were people who were not in favor of Jackson, and there's always going to be someone who's opposed to whoever's in the government, a new political party was created specifically to oppose Jackson. And this was made up of national Republicans like John Quincy Adams, another group called the Anti-Masons, and Democrats, which is what Andrew Jackson was, Democrats who did not agree with Jackson. And so this political party was formed around 1834. And it was, um, let's see, the reason it's called the Whig Party came from the 17th century British Whig group that defended English freedoms against the, um, like, taking advantage of um Basically, the, the Stuart kings were taking advantage of the English freedoms. And so that's kind of who they modeled their ideas after. And so they started putting forth their own candidates. Um, and in 1836, I think the, the Democratic Party was too strong. And Martin Van Buren was too strong in his own political campaigning. Um, techniques that Van Buren won very easily. But by the next election in 1840, they had Whigs had gained momentum. Um, and they brought forth William Henry Harrison. And we know that he was the governor of Indiana. And he fought an Indian alliance at the Battle of Tippecanoe and won. And so he, he had gained a lot of support, and he actually won the presidency as a Whig uh, political party candidate. And as you know, and we talked about this, he died two months later of pneumonia because he talked for two hours in the rain at his own inauguration. And the thing of it is, his vice president was John Tyler, who was a Democrat. And he promised the Whigs, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do everything that you believe in. But actually, when he did, he kind of stabbed the Whigs in the back and became Democrat again. And the Whig party was furious. An angry mob gathered at the White House because of it and threw rocks through the windows and burned the president. Like they had a little doll of the president and burned him in front of the White House. And to protest Tyler's rejection of the Whig agenda, all the members of his own cabinet resigned except for one. 
And he's known as the president without a party. He vetoed nine bills after his or during his four years in office, and that was more than any previous one-term president. And so that really frustrated Whig plans. And um, the Whigs tried to impeach him, but it it didn't it didn't pan out. So the Whigs were having problems, obviously, with their own candidates, but they also had problems within them their own political party. They had different interests and um, conflict within, and so they kind of lost a lot of the momentum they had with William Henry Harrison. In 1848 and 1852, they tried to repeat their success in eight, like with William Henry Harrison, and they used another military leader, uh, Zachary Taylor. He was also an Indian fighter and hero of the Mexican War, and um, he um, he he won, but he was the last Whig that did win. Um, by what does it say? In 1852, when it's time to reelect another president, they tried with General Winfield Scott, and it didn't. It, he didn't win. There were too many internal conflicts about slavery and other things that this this particular party died out. Now, the people who were part of that later became the Republican Party that we know today. Uh, but these are the things that Andrew Jackson had to deal with, and these were the things that the United States was dealing with in terms of can a state refuse to follow federal law, more people were actually voting, which was a good thing. It was becoming more democratic. Um, we'll talk about Indian removal after this little lecture. And um, the, the second bank war really was about the presidential power of veto and should they use it and, um, you know, who's exercising his right to do so. And people are like, I don't know. I don't know if that's right or not. And so that's what um, Jackson's presidency looked like and kind of, you know, paved the way for more political parties to come in and um, have their say as well. So there you go. I think after this, you have a quiz. I hope you took good notes. Thanks for listening.